Are we giving into evil? Yes, we are. And this is part two of a series. Yesterday I read the Do As the Criminals Say order released by the Minneapolis police. This is a refusal to stand up to evil by those with the lawful authority to stop it. This is a green light to criminals to prey on the innocent and to steal anything they want without any public resistance. This governmental cowardice produces fear and cynicism in the public, and yet, from city to state, it just spreads and continues to spread. It's trending now all over the United States. In Portland, the district attorney, Mike Schmidt, just publicly announced that city's surrender to evil. He said he's the lawful authority who could stop this. But here's what he said. He's refusing to do his duty to prosecute most crimes by rioters, including these crimes that are on the books, interfering with an officer, disorderly conduct, criminal trespass, harassment, escape in the third degree, and riot. These are all crimes on the books, and he's not prosecuting them. Attacks on police officers and resisting arrest will be scrutinized based on whether or not police were doing their duty. If they were doing their duty, and this caused rioters to, quote, instinctively lash out, is, is what he said, the district attorney, then the police would be held at fault for making the criminals break the law. <laughs> Simply by doing their duty to stop the criminals from breaking the law, the policemen will be prosecuted. This is why policemen all over the country are just bailing out. They're not even waiting for their departments to be defunded. They're leaving. They're breaking out today. I read an article about um, the police in San Francisco um, many times more than those who quit last year have quit, you know, just in the first months of 2020. And many more are, are looking for other jobs elsewhere. And so back to Portland, after almost 100 days of riots, any disincentive to rioting or stealing or destroying and attacking policemen is just totally gone. Especially when the district attorney steps up and stands up in public and has a press conference and says, hey, we're not going to prosecute these crimes. And we're going to blame the policemen. If you all throw tantrums and act up and... And, yeah, tantrums is a good word for it. If we, you know, if you make these rioters riot and commit crimes, we're going to blame the policemen for provoking them to do it by trying to enforce the law. And so... Countless other cities now are just following this trend to incentivize crime, to incentivize evil in the name of what? Solidarity with the oppressed? Well, no, it's actually, and I'm going to explore this more in, in, in this episode and also in tomorrow's part three. And I, I want you to hear the line of reasoning and argument. Why are they doing this? Really, is it, you know, they, many of them claim it's just to be in solidarity with the oppressed. And those who've had a hard time over the years or the decades. No, it's really to gain some kind of favor from the criminals. But all the authorities get is derisive last laughter, as we explored yesterday. So what happens to a culture when policemen and district attorneys and citizens just start giving in like this more and more and more every week, every month? Is there any evidence in any city at any time in history where criminals just simply calm down and behave themselves because nothing is now motivating them to lash out? Well, no, of course not. Criminals will lash out with ever-increasing brutality and hatred of authority. Criminals take full advantage of weakness by moving even more boldly against unprotected victims. That's, that's what they will do when they're unrestrained. And the law no longer restrains them, when fear of punishment no longer restrains them. And so now rioters in Minneapolis can command their victims to obey the authorities and subsidize robbery. Robbers can just simply say to, you know, the average guy on the street, you need to do what the police say and just give us your wallet. And if you take your phone and dial 911, the dispatcher will simply just tell you to follow the rules and give us your stuff. So just give us everything. Give me your phone. Give me your car keys. Give me your house keys. Do what I say, just as you have been ordered to do from on high. And so accomplished thieves, you know, doing this can probably say all this with, with a straight face, but beginner thieves probably will not be able to do it. 
But let me just say here, I really am not laughing at this. And if we attempt to be honest about this danger, we have to say the authorities have betrayed both justice and their mandate to protect citizens and citizens' property. They have a mandate for that. And they've, they betrayed it. Authorities have instead chosen to support the lawless in their efforts to overthrow the rule of law. The, you know, the criminals are trying to steal the law and destroy it. And so these city officials are now accomplices in crime, accomplices in the dismantling of law and order. And by this betrayal, they're saying the criminals have a claim, some sort of a claim to lawless behavior. Claims on others' private property and some strange moral right to terrorize citizens with criminal acts as though they deserve it, that the criminals deserve having this right to terrorize citizens with criminality. And this is, in fact, what the criminals are saying, that they have a right to all these things, that they're saying a certain race of person deserves to be terrorized, robbed from, dispossessed of his property because he's of a certain race of persons. And then the police say terrorized citizens will be at fault if they refuse to do as the criminals say. And we need to explore how this is an inversion of justice, why it's happening and what it really looks like more deeply. There are several reasons this is morally wrong and morally incoherent, which may explain why Today's self-righteous media can't figure out what to say from one day to the next. For example, we're told on one day citizens don't need guns because they can just call the police who have guns. And the next day, they say the police should not have guns. And the next day, they say the cops should not have jobs either. Defund the police. The next day, they tell us that minority, minorities should be able to have all the guns they want to protect their communities which are now police-free and don't have any police protection. But then the next day, they say that if there were simply more minorities in positions of political power, that utopia would appear and guns would disappear. And so there's, there is no coherence to what they're saying. It's, it is like a fantasy and fantasy thinking about utopias just around the corner. The media is not bothering to dig into the reasons, the real reasons that real evil exists or why Minneapolis is in so much trouble. That you know, Just to take Minneapolis as an example, the media simply repeats PC slogans about a lack of social justice and civil rights. They say there is no full participation of black citizens in Minneapolis because why? Well, because racism. You know, you just keep bringing this up. If you want a cause for something you want to complain about, racism. But on the contrary, I mean, just think about this with Minneapolis. If the media would do their duty and do their job and do their research, they, they would have to stop saying this. Minneapolis is in trouble because corrupt political candidates began going for the votes of the lawless and the unproductive two decades ago. And getting those votes at whatever the cost to civility and law and fiscal responsibility. That's why Minneapolis is in trouble. It's not because of racism. Emotional and irresponsible press celebrities just don't know this, and they prefer repeating what criminals say than digging into some simple history. And this is why the media keeps calling for more Democrats in office as the solution to every injustice. They also infer that city crimes against humanity, um, especially in Minneapolis, are the fault of authorities who are Republican. And not only Republican, but the worst species of all Republicans, those privileged white variety who are always the inherent enemies of the people. But what is the truth, really, in Minneapolis? If they would simply look at the history of the city, they would find that progressive Minnesota got rid of the white Republican office holders many years ago. And today, virtually every official in the city in the city of Minneapolis, with influence over the Minneapolis police and influence over the decisions to keep dangerous policemen like Derek Chauvin on the force and to keep criminals on the street, they're not Anglo-Saxon Protestants. They're liberal Democrats. What are the facts? The governor, the attorney general, 
the Minneapolis congresswoman and the mayor, they're all Democrats. The city council in Minneapolis consists of 12 Democrats and one Green Party member. There's zero Republicans. The Democrat Party is the establishment system that protects inhumane cops and career criminals and unjust judges. The countless injustices on the streets did not begin with today's green light to muggers to just go forth and mug. It started a lot earlier with politically correct votes. And so if the media is really determined to drag race and civil rights into this story, they, they've got to stop failing to report that voters have willingly elected a black attorney general, a black police chief, a black vice president of the city council, a black congresswoman for the district. I mean, th these are facts that are not being reported to the general public. These political leaders have gained full particip participation in the system. They were lawfully elected. People went to the polls and they put them into office. And what have they done with full participation? The f and this is the other sad fact of the matter. Maybe this is why the media is, is not reporting it. These politicians have protected totalitarian cops and tyrant criminals and corrupt politicians who have bankrupted the city of Minneapolis. Minneapolis officials encouraged rioters this year by pouring fuel on the myth of American systemic racism. Uh, rioting exploded. Police retreated. And then city officials <laughs> deflected attention by attacking President Trump for glorifying violence. That was the term they used. When he warned rioters that if the local authorities failed to protect law-abiding citizens, he, the president, would meet force with force and bring in federal muscle. And so the problem in Minnesota, it's not, and these are you know similar to many of the cities that I'll be referencing here in this essay, it, it's not systemic racism. It is systemic, politically correct cowardice, appeasing and rewarding criminals. It's not justice. It's cultural suicide. And Minneapolis voters we have to say, are not uniquely lawless. Millions of other voters are just as woke and confused. Western citizens from Rome to Los Angeles are actively appeasing systemic evil and systemic lawlessness. It's now systemic surrender that causes cultures to become failed states and then dead states. The problem is not racism right now. The problem is not historic civilization. The problem is a cowardly elite who are supportive of the criminally minded and who use their powers to keep citizens in a state of vulnerability, endangerment, and dependence. You know, here's their statement. Do not argue or fight with a criminal. Just do as they say. You know, and this, it keeps the citizens in a state of vulnerability and endangerment and dependence. They're teaching the city to be terrified of itself. And so politically correct leaders in France, Germany, Sweden, and Britain are now really confused about criminal evil, even toward women and children. They're so confused that they too have given criminals a green light to steal and kill and rape and destroy. Police, listen to this quote. British Labor Police Minister McNulty says no citizen can ever intervene to stop a crime in progress. And it's against the law to do that now. He says, witnesses to violent street crime should try to distract attackers by honking their car horns or even jumping up and down. Okay, <laughs> This is how you're supposed to stop the crime that's exploding on the streets of London. Any serious or courageous intervention is forbidden. Do you see how insane this is becoming when you appease criminality and you don't let the heroic and the courageous and the law-abiding uphold the law and defend the law and defend their streets and defend their people and defend their families. This is what happens. Serious or courageous intervention is forbidden. You can't resist criminals. And this, you know, this is what we're beginning to see in Minneapolis. This is what we've seen actually now for two and a half decades in London. Intervening to save the innocent or the weak, especially in London, will get the responsible and heroic citizen a conviction and probably a lawsuit from the criminal's family. In London, the centuries-old right of self-defense 
and the defense of the weak and the helpless has been removed as a legal option. It's just gone. Even within the walls of one's private home, private firearms have have been confiscated. And now London has set up boxes on street corners into which citizens are expected to surrender their kitchen knives because no citizen can be allowed to own any means of defense whatsoever. That's how, that's how insanity looks when you become a lawless people in a lawless city. And yet criminals are subsidized with taxpayer money, sympathy, and government protection from prosecution. prosecution. A very cruel irony is this one. Government sources say that they, okay, this is an irony, that they still have the moral high ground and they boast about it and they talk tough, even though they surrendered the moral high ground a long time ago. They still say they are tough on crime and they try to prove it by telling criminals who are released from custody just to behave themselves like polite law-abiding members of the community when there really is no law left to abide by except these kinds of laws which say, like in Minneapolis, do not argue or fight with a criminal. Do as they say. I mean, if that's all there is to do, how do you know? The law-abiding citizen is, is committing suicide along with his city, and the perpetrators just laugh. An example here from Germany, a 24-year-old migrant from Sudan was released from the police custody after being held for questioning at a police station. In Germany, and after crossing the street, the man who receives welfare payments, you know, free money from the taxpayer, he gets 300 euros a month in social welfare benefits. So he crosses the street, he dropped his pants, he exposed himself in public, and he shouted to the police, Who are you? You cannot do anything to me. Whatever I cannot get from the state, I will steal. So he's pronouncing his intentions and, and, and gloating that he, he can't be touched by the authorities anymore because he has a, a protection to be able to celebrate evil in any way that he wants to, to celebrate lawlessness, to commit lawlessness, to be funded by the state, to go about it doing it. And so there is no longer any moral authority or determination to protect citizens from serious determined criminals. And one prime reason for this is fear. The authorities, really, are afraid of the very criminals they celebrate as culturally different, like these criminals who are in need of cultural understanding. And so surrender to and appeasement of evil are now fixed policies of government. And these policies invite the criminal element to organize and take over, take over everything, including the police, the courts, the schools, and the cowering government functionaries. And all the absurd elites can say is, and the, the fearful elites... Um, please behave yourselves as you help yourselves to the wealth of our civilization, what's left of it. Now, tomorrow in part three, I want to give more specific examples on what happens to a city when criminals realize they will never be prosecuted. You can see the link in the notes below. If you like content like this, please consider subscribing. If you know others who would benefit from this material, please share it with them. To connect with us directly, please visit jeffreybotkin.com and send any questions or thoughts that you might have to questions at jeffreybotkin.com.